It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome our second speaker, uh, Dr. Jonathan Krauss, who's uh, a lecturer in strategic studies, if, I, if you are still currently at the Royal Air Force College, Cranwell. Uh, Jonathan is one of, the, I think, a, a group of emerging historians who are concentrating uh, uh, under, uh, the, under the wing of Bill Philpott, would it be fair? Uh, on the French army, I think, uh, some very exciting work being done in that field. Uh, Jonathan has published uh, a book on the uh, early trench tactics of the French army, particularly concentrating on the Second Battle of Artois in 1915. And uh, I gather he's currently writing a new history of the French army. So we've got Robert on the German army and, and Jonathan on the French. That'll be something to look forward to. And uh, Jonathan's also contributed to a volume of essays on French generals and has done the essay on Philippe Pétain, I gather. So if I call all that right, let's welcome our second speaker, Jonathan Krauss. Right, thanks for that. Uh, reassuring that you'll notice from Bob's excellent presentation, he chose Feldgrau for his background. Uh, of course, naturally, I chose Horizon Blue. A bit of a theme there. Uh, before we get started, just sort of a word of warning. Um, I am from California, you know, deep environmentalist, so a lot of this is recycled and reused. Uh, so it is worrying to look out and see faces that I know have uh, heard this three, four, five times. You'll be all right. Now, to start out, why study the French army? Why does it matter? Uh, well, aside from the fact that, of course, the decisive front is in France, uh, the war on the Western Front in so many ways is really a Franco-German conflict at its core. You can think of it as sort of part two of the three-part series, 1870, 1914, and 1940, part of a long, longer-term sort of Franco-German struggle for uh, dominance on the continent. In terms of sheer size, uh, the French army demands attention. Uh, in 1914, a mobilization, uh, French, uh, France mobilizes in and around uh, 2.6 uh, million men. Over the course of the war, somewhere between 8 and 10 million uh, serve in the colors. Uh, Germany, of course, mobilizes just a little under 3 million in 1914. Uh, Britain's there too, right? 125,000-ish, right? Um, uh, even by 1918, after the great, uh, the heavy losses that the French army takes throughout the war, um, they're still able to field nine field armies uh, along the Western Front. Uh, Britain has five at this point. Uh, the U.S. has two. Uh, there's the Belgian forces as well. Uh, the war is won, if you like, under the command of a French general, Ferdinand Foch, who we'll hear about later. Um, it's very odd that in the English-speaking world, this army and its commanders have been sort of lar largely whitewashed out of the history of the First World War. They aren't given the sort of prominence that you would expect when you see when you come out of Victoria Station in London, you don't see a bunch of people going to take pictures of the Ferdinand Foch statue. Um, he is there, yeah, as you may or may not know. Um, the only Frenchman to be both a Marshal of France and Britain at the same time. Uh, at his death, he was a Marshal of France, uh, Britain, Poland, I believe Italy as well, and a similar equivalent rank for the United States. Um, you don't get commanders like this every generation or even every century, and it's largely gone from uh, our public perception. Now, if you want sheer size for 1915, uh, here's a little uh, graph, if you like, talking about frontages. Uh, you'll see Britain is there, right? Uh, about 50 kilometers of front. I can't quite prove it, uh, but I think that Montenegro actually has a longer front uh, in 1915, if we want to talk about that. 
Um, now, I've called this talk the worst year. Uh, what does that mean? Now, partially it is just in terms of sheer casualties. Now, if any of you are good at maths better than me, you'll notice these numbers actually don't add up quite right, especially the uh, figures for casualties, uh, deaths rather, which is the uh, right-hand column for you. The left-hand is just total casualties that year, which includes wounded, missing, uh, all of that. Um, partially, this is because there isn't, still isn't, a really good breakdown of per-year deaths. Uh, the per-year deaths go back to an article written all the way back in the 1960s, the 50th anniversary, uh, in the uh, Revue Historique des Armées. Uh, the larger figures come from more recent works, uh, especially uh, Francois Caito's uh, Gagné le Grand Guerre, the excellent work on attrition and the French armies. Um, conduct of the war, uh, and a few more recent works, uh, Pity of War, Pyrrhic Victory, these sort of things that, that uh, are, in, are in English and that you will all uh, know, or many of you will know. So just to compare, and we have to be careful here because these figures that you see are slightly um, conservative. Okay, If you add it up, there's about 100,000 casualties missing. So if you want to put them each up by in and around 20,000, you can. Um, We'll stick with 349,000 dead just for, for ease of reference, but just to put it in perspective, I mean, it really does have to hit you right. I mean, this is a, uh, thank you, uh, this is a level of loss that is almost unprecedented. Um, if you want to talk in terms of the uh, percentage of the population, um, this is the equivalent in France over the course of the war, they lose about 3.4% of their population of something like 11 million Americans dying over the course of about four or five years. Um, really horrendous loss. And so when we talk about uh, 1940, for example, and how the Second World War goes, it's easy to sort of brush this aside. This really is catastrophic, um, has serious generational implications. Well, there's other ways we can talk about it. So we can talk about it in terms of, uh, sort of ratios. Um, Casualties suffered are bad, but if you have nothing to compare them against, it's not really very helpful. Uh, this is an area where the French, especially in 1915, are really hurting. They do an especially poor job. We can break it down more uh, extensively here by year, uh, and you can see that bar none, it's by far the worst year they have. Most years, they're actually not that far off uh, the casualties they're able to inflict. Um, they're slightly on the wrong side of the uh, attrition equation, if you want to look at it that way. But on the whole, they're not doing as bad as perhaps you might expect. Uh, and of course, given the fact that the Allies have such a uh, predominance of, of manpower throughout the war um, relative to Germany, this is a war you can win attritionally. And of course, eventually, uh, the Allies do. Now, the talk really at its base will be about how does this happen? You know, how do we get to that two to one figure. Why do the French lose so many? Why do they keep attacking? What was the point? Did they get anything for it? And to answer that properly, appropriately, we really have to start all the way back in 1870. The Franco-Prussian War is absolutely formational, obviously, for both countries. It quite literally creates the German state. Uh, for France, psychologically, it completely shapes uh, how they exist, really, for the next 70 years in many ways. Um, it, of course, eventually founds or, or is part of the founding process of the Third Republic, which does fight the First World War. Um, most of the senior commanders uh, in the French army during the First World War got their first service during the Franco-Prussian War. It's very much in their mindsets. Uh, Joff, uh, Foch, Pétain, these men are 18, 19, 20 when this is happening, right? So they're at an impressionable age already, and their country is being racked by not just invading forces and uh, a large insurgency, especially in the South, but of course the Paris Commune uh, and all of the real sort of tragedies uh, that come with 1870. And they learn a few, well, I say learn, uh, they take away from the war a few key lessons. Um, principal among them is the primacy of firepower. Um, one of the ways that Germany is able to do so well tactically, aside from uh, French logistical failures, is they're able to sort of park their art a rifle artillery out of range and basically just shell the French in their positions, giving the French a horrible uh, uh, decision, right? What do you do? Do you retreat, in which case you just let the Germans keep coming uh, whenever they meet you, or do you advance into this impenetrable field of fire? 
the French decide that they are never going to put themselves in that position again. Uh, and much of their thinking, much of their operational sort of theories in the First World War and before the First World War are based on this um, principal concept that you cannot just sit there. There's absolutely nothing worse. Um, so as Ferdinand Foch put it, of all faults, only one is disgraceful in action. And this is actually enshrined in French doctrine throughout the early war years. Um, you have to act. So if we want to say why are the French so over the top with their action, constantly attacking in the first two years of the war, this is at least part of it. Um, combined, of course, with the psychology of being attacked, right? And this isn't just something that high command is theorizing about. This is something that is, in many ways, being trained, what little training French soldiers received before the war, uh, right down to the bottom levels. So there is a commandant Larcher uh, who wrote, uh, reflecting on his experiences being trained in sort of the 1910s, that uh, the mentality created by the repetition of exercise of attack exercises almost completely excluded the defense. Defense was considered as exceptional, limited to isolated cases. When one wasn't attacking, it was only because one was waiting for the moment to attack. Okay, so this feeds in to their whole system. And it is, it, it's not just uh, the French who are talking like this. Uh, it is part of a wider European debate, or, or shall we say uh, modern army debate rather than just European, on what we can call firepower versus shock. Now this is an old debate, this doesn't originate just before the First World War. In many ways you could say it goes all the way back to Napoleon um, and how you deal with uh, firepower, especially modern firepower and, and modern artillery. Uh, the French are often sort of pilloried for their uh, particular approach to this, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, people accuse them of coming down too hard on the uh, shock side. Uh, that is, of course, a picture of picture of French infantry uh, attacking it with the bayonet. Uh, partially down to uh, this idea, l'offensive au trans, uh, the offensive to the limit or to the extreme. Uh, an idea that comes out first uh, really from a series of lectures um, from Colonel de Grand Maison uh, and a few papers written by Foch as well. Um, it basically states or codifies, if you like to use that word, what I've been talking about, that you should attack with everything you have, uh, rush uh, the enemy, and through your élan vital, through your vital spirit, through your very Frenchness, you will overcome any amount of metal that happens to be coming your way, carry the field, and will be victorious. Now, French commanders who are talking about this and thinking about this, they're not naive. They're not suggesting that you'll be able to do this sort of thing and not suffer casualties. They accept that casualties are going to be excessively heavy. We can think forward to uh, Charles Mangin during the war, uh, famously called The Butcher, who supposedly said, it may well be apocryphal, um, that no matter what we do, we lose a lot of men. So very heavy casualties are expected uh, in these sorts of attacks, but it's seen as the only way to actually, first off, get tr troops to uh, take the advance forward. Um, they fear that because firepower has become so intense, so heavy, that troops will just go to ground and he won't be able to get them back up again. Right? They'll just stay there from sheer terror. And so by giving them this almost mystical sense of, not invincibility, but the emotional and uh, sort of moral ability to overcome overwhelming odds is the only thing that will get them to close with the enemy, um, drive them from the field, and eventually win. <coughs> Now, partly this is uh, a discussion that's forced upon uh, the world by developments in artillery. Uh, we focus, of course, uh, on, or, or rather, there is a popular focus on machine guns. Uh, you here will largely mostly know that it's artillery. It's the real killer of the war. Uh, Bob's given us a, a great sort of primer in, in German artillery, which I'll try to uh, talk about a little bit uh, and reference. Um, the French in 1897 revolutionize the way artillery functions. With the development of this gun here, the French 75, uh, seen at the Imperial War Museum. This was, shot was taken uh, maybe 20 minutes before I was shouted to stop climbing on this particular piece of kit as I'm trying to figure out how it works. Um, it's research, right? Okay. <laughs> so this is the gun that revolutionizes the way artillery is used. Uh, even to this day, it is the first gun to implement a hydraulic recoil system. 
So of course you can fire it, the barrel slides back, slides back into position, you can reload and fire again. Before this gun is uh, unveiled in 1897, you're lucky to get in around one, ra uh, one aimed shot off per minute by your artillery. With this gun, you can get anywhere from 15 to 20. Okay? So even if you don't uh, increase the sheer number of artillery, your firepower is just increased 15 to 20 fold. Um, this is what creates the great fields of fire in the early 1900s and, and beyond. Um, now, this gun winds up not being terribly suited to trench warfare. It has a very flat trajectory. Um, it doesn't have sufficient payload. Uh, Bob was talking about the 100 millimeter guns um, that are sort of the standard, um, not standard German field drill, because of course they have 77s, but one of their main guns at 75 millimeters just doesn't have the same punch. Um, if you're in defilade, uh, so if you're on the reverse slopes, you're behind uh, a hill, it can't hit you, it just doesn't have the same arc that it needs. Um, the French do have some heavy artillery. They enter the war with about 308. Um, but this is just a, a pitiful number, right? They have 11,000 in store, um, but they're mostly guns from the 1870s, horribly outdated, very, very slow, um, that they built after the Franco-Prussian War. There's the criticism, of course, that like so many armies, the French are insistent on winning the last war, and they have all this kit to do it. They don't have quite enough to fight a modern uh, trench battle. Uh, now, there are orders for modern guns, um, but in typical uh, French bureaucratic style, uh, they decide, well, we don't need this many. We can cut maybe half off by further developing the 75. They tried putting wooden fins on the shell that would sort of open midway through flight so that it would force the shell to plunge down. Um, they tried packing the uh, shell with less explosives so that it would just sort of get halfway and die and drop straight down. Um, both these measures were completely ineffective and were used as cost-saving measures to stop the French getting heavy artillery, modern heavy artillery, which is why at least for the first few years of the war, uh, Germany is absolutely dominant uh, in this area. Uh, you had uh, rather forward-thinking uh, French officers saying, well, why do we need an artillery piece that can fire 10 kilometers? Humans can only see for four. What do we need? Um, and so you had this sort of real bureaucratic inertia stopping the French from modernizing. And in some ways, it's actually encoded into their regulations. So the final artillery regulations that uh, are written in 1913, right before the war, states that it's essential that uh, artillery supports attacks. It does not prepare them. Artillery supports them meaning there's no concept of this sort of preparatory bombardment, softening uh, enemy defenses up, and then attacking. It's meant purely as sort of cover, usually with barrage, lots of shrapnel. Um, not the sort of artillery fire that you're going to need uh, on the Western Front. Um, as a result, our French artillerymen are especially poorly trained. This isn't just because of a lack of actual training grounds, which France is horribly short of, um, but they're trained that since you're just gonna be firing mass barrage, you know, you're not going to hit anything in particular. Just fire as fast as you can. You know, it doesn't matter what you're aiming at. It doesn't matter what you hit. If you put enough shells out there, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, Foch at this time is quoted as saying, uh, 15 minutes uh, are ten intense artillery fire is enough to make any area uninhabitable and therefore uninhabited. Um, slightly optimistic. So how does this look in 1915 when we hit 1915? Uh, French infantry, again, often sort of mocked for their uniforms, which are very reminiscent of, again, the 1870s of a bygone era. Um, my colleagues who do 1914 cannot find any evidence anywhere uh, in the German or French sources that the Pantalon Rouge actually gave them away. Maybe there is evidence somewhere. Far more likely or far more often, it's metal uh, glinting in the sunlight, you know, their bayonets, uh, these sorts of things, which makes more sense, right? Um, especially when things get a bit colder, the greatcoat gets covered, and you have maybe from just below the knee to just above the belt of red showing. Okay? It's not nearly as showy as people want to make it out to be, but you know, it's still not ideal, right? It's still not quite appropriate. Um, French infantry make a series of very bold, very brave, and altogether completely hopeless attacks in 1914. Um, if you think back to the slide I had uh, looking at casualty figures per year, you'll notice that it's their second worst year of the war, 301,000 dead. Of course, years an overstatement. We're talking about just a couple of months. So if you put that 
sustained over the course of an entire year. More French people, in theory, die in 1914 than the entire American Civil War. Absolutely crit um, sort of, uh, horrible. Uh, why is this? They're attacking oftentimes with no artillery support at all, um, boldly rushing into action, leaving the guns still sort of covered up um, and with the wagons. When they come up against uh, organized German forces, they're cut down. Other times, uh, French formations will be marching. They'll hear the sound of guns and then, and I'm not even kidding you, stop for a two-hour lunch then decide to pick up and continue marching towards the guns and then wonder why by the time they get there, it's already over. Uh, so you have a series of just really gross uh, tactical error and mistake that makes it such a horrible year. And it puts this guy in a really horrible position. Uh, Joseph Joffre had become uh, really sort of chief of staff or if you like head of the French army because um, it doesn't always translate quite well. Uh, back in 1911, he's the commander in chief from 1914 to 1916. Um, and he has to sort of save the situation. The Germans uh, win on basically all of the early encounter battles. They're pushing the French back. Um, you know, the famous retreat from Mons and all this. this is happening across an entire front, right? It's not just happening to the British. Um, most of the commanders had been appointed for political reasons uh, or for social reasons. Uh, don't forget this is in the aftermath of the Dreyfus Affair and the Affair des Fiches, so there's serious sort of controversies um, throughout the French army and French society um, with officers being promoted based on how Republican they are rather than how competent they are. Uh, some of them having uh, held their commands for decades and are completely uh, behind the times. So over the course of just a few months, or really initially a few weeks, uh, Joffre winds up firing 162 generals and colonels uh, from across the army. 70% uh, of corps commanders are fired in the first three, three or four months of the war. Um, about 40% of all senior commanders of all kinds, uh, including general ranks, are fired. Now, this does a few things. Uh, it dramatically and very quickly improves the uh, sort of command capabilities of the French army, which is good. Uh, it also means there are quite a lot of generals and colonels and uh, lieutenant colonels, not lieutenant colonels, different army, uh, that owe their promotion directly to Joffre. So some that is working not only with almost complete impunity, uh, the government gives him almost no oversight for the first year of the war, also has large parts of the army directly reliant upon him or owing their uh, situated position to him. So this is how we enter 1915. Um, I won't tell you too much about what transport what is, how it works, you know, we can move on, we're fine. The first big battle they fight is First Artois. This is not a map of First Artois. It's a map of Second Artois. There are no good maps of First Artois, unfortunately. Fought 16th, 18th of December. Three days, very quick. It's the first sort of proper trench battle, trench offensive that the French try to fight. Uh, it's operated under uh, Ferdinand Foch's Group Provisoire du Nord, a provisional group, a provisional Northern Army group. And he orders that it's l uh, less important to advance rapidly, but essential to move securely, step by step, as each objective is gained. So you can compare that to, again, this sort of offensivo et trans, uh, excessive, um, aggressive attitude. Very, very different, very measured, very calm. Unfortunately, they just don't have the artillery. Uh, in theory, three corps are supposed to be attacking. And instead of all attacking at once, they have to take all the heavy artillery and fire all for one corps one day all for one the next, all for the third on the third day. They have to shift because they just don't have enough to support themselves. Needless to say, every one of these attacks is a complete failure. They effectively take nothing, take heavy casualties, and have to call it quits after three days. Um, they do a little bit better in their next effort for Champagne a um, couple months later. And they heavily outnumber the Germans uh, here. They have about 155,000 uh, troops to, to begin with. Germany has only 81,000. Um, the French have 879 guns, 110 heavy guns. Now again, when they marched to war with only 308, to have 110 for just one battle, for just one army, is really pretty impressive. Um, when they go over the top on the 16th of February, they meet with mixed results. Um, some areas are able to advance over the course of the entire battle, um, about two, three kilometers, uh, maybe four, in some really successful sectors. Um, not fantastic, but it could be worse. Uh, 
the Germans, uh, and this is sort of a pattern that comes um, for many of these Allied attacks, they panic horribly in the first few days. They think, we're going to be overrun, we can't stop these people, what are we going to do? The French attack peters out, reinforcements come in, and including the Prussians, everything gets locked down. And within about four or five days, the Germans have more or less complete mastery uh, of the battle. Um, morale dips pl uh, precipitously. Uh, commanders get very lazy. They start ordering things like, uh, instead of sort of complicated uh, attack orders, just same troops, same objective. That's the entire order for the day. You lot, that trench, do it again. Okay. And they wonder why, again, casualties are so high. Um, Artillery bombardments are absolutely uniform. They all lasted for exactly 30 minutes. Uh, so the Germans had absolutely no uh, sort of question about when or where the attack was coming. Uh, morale is so bad that within 10 days, um, General Duma of the 17th Corps is ordering that men who refuse to be over the top are pistol whipped repeatedly until they go over the top. Okay, already by early 1915, they're having to basically whip their men into combat. After six weeks, the French suffered 260,000 casualties, move at most three kilometers in the most successful sectors. In most sectors, they basically take nothing. Okay. So not a great way to uh, start out. Now, to an extent, this isn't entirely unexpected. There is a pattern, right, in First World War attacks, um, here written by, I want to say, Vagon. They uh, vague diminue, so the waves diminish, right? The initial push is much more successful than later pushes. Um, eventually, by the end of the war, the Allies sort of turned this into a codified system, right, with the, the attacks in 1918, the 100 days very rapidly attacking up and down the front rather than picking a single battlefield and trying to bore your way through it. But that's still years in the future. Uh, they tr the French try to learn um, from for Champagne. For all their many mistakes and failures, the one thing we can say about them is they do take a lot of effort to analyze why things went wrong, and they do try to change. Now, these two men, Joff and Foch, come to very different conclusions. Joff's uh, conclusion is uh, the hour of success is fleeting. So you can get local successes here and there, and the only way to turn that into a larger success is have the right troops right there immediately behind them and punching through the gap. Uh, what the French call the continuous battle, so just constantly feeding troops in very, very quickly, one after the next, and hope that somewhere, somehow, some troops get through. Foch looks at it a little bit differently. Again, very measured, wants to talk about discrete um, attacks on very clear, very close by uh, objectives, jump, uh, consolidate, prepare, and do it again. What the British would later call bite and hold, right? Um, and I. Don't know, I can't prove that Rawlinson is, is picking up on any of this, but again, very similar ideas and a very similar part of the front. Um, Foch will go on, of course, to be the technically French group commander for the Battle of the Somme, so the, there, should, there might be uh, some overlap there. Um, now, Foch is given a chance to uh, fight the next battle, Second Battle of Artois, and he does so with a little bit of benefit. The French uh, develop a new doctrine based partially on their failures the first half of 1915. Um, this doctrine, uh, but des conditions d'action offensive d'ensemble, uh, goal and conditions of sort of a, a grand offensive, if you like, a uh, general offensive, um, which codifies a few uh, key things. It's the first uh, clear French uh, doctrine that I can find that codifies the rolling barrage. Uh, they state that um, at the hour fixed for attack, the barrage will advance uh, progressively to make in front and on the flanks of an enemy um, a transversal barrage which will protect their advance. That's some sort of absurd term. But they saw this thing as, again, a, a wall of steel and flame advancing at 25 meter bounds and doing what a rolling barrage does. And very early, um, most armies aren't codifying it uh, quite this way, quite this early. Uh, they also uh, talk about natural de tranche, uh, as trench clearers, moppers up. So having secondary waves come in behind the assault wave, armed specially with trench clearing weapons, grenades, revolvers, uh, big knives, you know, this sort of stuff, to come in afterwards, clear out machine gun nests, any resistance that had, um, hadn't been taken out in the initial uh, wave. 
If you think back to uh, British efforts on the 1st of July 1916, the failure to do this is, of course, one of their great um, failures of the day. It's one of the reasons why the British attack is held up so much. The French learn this lesson relatively early on, um, and they do do a pretty good job of it. They receive special training, again, special um, equipment. Um, they often have to get into very serious fights with the engineers to get this equipment, but assuming the infantry can win those bureaucratic battles, they tend to do uh, very well in that role. Uh, you can see this together as part of the sort of an early uh, adaptation of, of stormtroop tactics, right? Um, they're expressly told to bypass strong points, to uh, penetrate as deeply and as quickly as they possibly can and allow these secondary waves to then take out these machine gun nests or other strong points that have survived. Um, it's not as well developed, obviously, as it would be later in the war, um, but it is worth pointing out that this is largely a French a development. It's not a German development. Um, the Germans are thinking along rather different lines. Uh, so with all of this and with Foch um, at the head at least of the army group, uh, the French come into Second Artois and the initially at least they perform much better. Uh, the Moroccan division in the middle, uh, which you can just about see, uh, advances four and a half kilometers in the first hour and a half. Um, its historians later write that it was like uh, marching in open terrain, that when they reached Vimy Ridge and turn around and look back, the enemy camp was in manifest disarray. Was the, was the exact quote. Nothing really stood before them. Um, to the next, uh, next to them, the 77th, uh, do very similar. Uh, advanced uh, troops from the 77th wind up uh, all the way in Givenchy, so actually slightly behind Vimy Ridge. Troops from both the 77th and the Moroccan Division are fighting along Vimy Ridge for about three days. Um, if you've ever been, you'll see, of course, the grand Canadian monument, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and across the parking lot, this horrible little derelict, uh, untended monument to the Moroccans, marking about as far as they got uh, on that day. I mean, they're really only 70 meters from pushing the Germans off the other edge. Uh, they do this partially by uh, selecting their best troops uh, to lead these attacks. The 77th is an Alpine division, so these are long service regulars, uh, elite troops. Uh, the 70th uh, next to them is um, a bit more metropolitan, but commanded by um, Emile Fayol, one of the best commanders uh, that uh, France produces in the war. Um, of course, the Moroccan division, colonial troops, not actual Moroccans, by the way, but rather troops stationed in Morocco and large quantities of uh, foreign legion. So if you go in this area, you'll find uh, monuments to uh, Poles, Czechs, I don't know if the Greeks have a monument. There's a whole battalion of Russians. Um, so very motivated, very well trained. They're trained twice in the doctrine uh, that I showed you from uh, April 1915. So they're up on all the latest uh, methodology. They know what they're doing, and they do a very good job. Ultimately, however, it's just too difficult. Uh, on the northern flank, you'll see a series of villages and Notre Dame de Lorette, a hill which slows down the French advance. In the south, uh, Neuville saint vaast and again, another village. So. In the middle, uh, Peytown's 33rd Corps, uh, Philippe Peytown, punches through and does very well, but his troops wind up getting flanking fire from 360 degrees while they're atop Vimy Ridge. Uh, they eventually have to pull back. The Moroccan division is more or less wiped out in three days. Uh, the French aren't able to attack again properly until the 16th of June. It takes them that long to really reconstitute. There are smaller scale attacks, things are happening. Um, but the 16th, they have uh, a new weapon of their own. This is the first time that uh, the French use uh, poison gas. Uh, they claim to have only started producing this or, or, or thinking about it in January 1915 after they have evidence that the Germans uh, are doing the same. This, of course, is complete nonsense, right? Um, they've been planning to do it uh, really as, as early as they could. It just takes them a long time to actually uh, get the wheels moving. Uh, after Second Ypres, after the Germans uh, Unleash chlorine, 22nd of April. Um, the bureaucratic gloves come off, if you like, and most French gas systems uh, get a green light. Now, there's a problem here. France isn't Germany. Okay? They don't have the chemical industry to actually do this on any sort of massive scale. Most of their um, heavy chemicals are still imported. Obviously, imports from Germany are cut off in 1914. They have to import from the US at a heightened price. Um, what little chlorine production the French have is really one factory 
that is in fact largely owned by German capital. Okay? So it's very difficult for them to um, produce gas, so they go about it a very different way. They don't use canisters, they don't have masses of chlorine, instead they use their own sort of interesting mixtures. For second Artois, they have a mixture of phosphorus and carbon disulfide, um, which is not exactly a common gas you associate with the First World War. Um, in some ways it's effective, it's incendiary, right? The phosphorus creates a lot of smoke and a lot of flame, um, and the carbon disulfide um, is asphyxiating, so it suffocates um, troops. Uh, they also experiment, you'll see this uh, one here on the left, um, which is just a little sketch in the margins of one of these uh, early documents, uh, a mixture of potassium cyanide and hydrochloric acid uh, in a shell that would explode to create uh, gaseous hydrocyanic acid. It's a bit mean, really. Um, they end up not using it because it's um, partially because it's just horrible, right? It's too harsh, and also because they can't actually get it to produce as much gas as they want. Um, they use this gas uh, primarily at La Folie, if you see um, just south of Petit Vimy, uh, so it's, it was sort of a farm area just behind the shoulder of Vimy Ridge where the Germans had propped most of their artillery. Um, and when they inundate this area with gas on the 16th of June, the batteries are completely silenced for about two hours. Nothing. So the attack of the uh, 20th Corps down on the right, the so-called Iron Corps, uh, with its uh, iron and steel division, the 39th and 11th, uh, attack without any uh, German battery fire against them. Um, they're still not hugely successful. The Germans have completely revamped their defensive structure in this time period, but it's a real uh, showcase of what gas can do. Uh, and if you look at how gas is used for most of the war, the canister attack is not the way forward. It's using gas as uh, counter battery fire, neutralizing positions in the rear, um, and something that the French uh, really innovate, not because they're forward thinking, but because they don't have enough gas for canisters. The gas they have isn't really uh, canister deliverable, at least not properly. They also have no gas masks, so they can't gas an area and then walk into it. This is the only option they have. They sort of blunder, several blunders, to find the way that um, they wind up using gas for the rest of the war. Um, within a year, a little bit more than a year, so by mid-1916, a quarter of all French shells are gas. Okay, it becomes an absolutely critical component of their artillery doctrine, and one that's largely sort of uh, forgotten, right, skipped over, uh, left out. Uh, this attack ends up not being as successful. Uh, the Moroccans are, are reconstituted enough by this point so they're put back in the line. They uh, advance about a kilometer up to Cot 119, which you see there just north of Suchet, which the uh, Canadians called the Pimple. Uh, they take it, but not much else. Uh, the attack ultimately itself also fails. So where does that leave uh, France halfway through 1915? Well, it leaves them with a real sort of serious debate. What do we learn? What do all these offensives mean? Two guys. Uh, Joff and Castelnau, who is the uh, army, center army group commander down in the Champagne region, uh, they take away from it that a breakthrough is possible. They look at what the Moroccan division does on the 9th of May and say, well, look, if they can advance four and a half kilometers in an hour or so, we can do that anywhere. And that's in a heavily defended area. If we attack in the Champagne, which is just sort of soft, gentle rolling hills, no real villages or serious high ground to get in our way, we should be able to in Castelnau's uh, words, advanced 12 or 20 kilometers in the first 24 to 48 hours with rifles at the shoulder. He's expecting artillery to do such a good job that they can just walk over German uh, defenses. Falsch and Peytan, uh, a bit more realistic. And they said, first off, um, that's too risky. Uh, you know, if you don't get that big initial breakthrough, what are you left with, right? You're just left with enormous casualties and really nothing to show for it. Um, Foch saying, what we really need is just lots of gas, uh, and we really can't attack on a grand scale until we get more heavy artillery, especially modern pieces, and more gas. Then we can start thinking about smaller set pieces to capture key bits of terrain. Uh, Peytan, unsurprisingly, is even more sort of dour. Um, basically says there's nothing we can do, um, at least not for six or eight or nine months, for we have such a great preponderance of uh, material that then we can finally think about attacking. 
you get a similar interesting parallel uh, intellectually, psychologically, uh, on the Eastern Front. If you look at the Russian um, operations, um, they're often disastrous, uh, their offensives. And their response is, well, that's just because we didn't have enough shells. And they then refuse to attack unless they have absolutely massive amounts of materiel. So thinking of it not as uh, an operational procedural failing, but a sheerly uh, material failing. And part of the French army suffers from the same idea. They're eventually wrong, um, but they have some of the same ideas. Now, the last one I'll talk about, I'll only talk about it briefly because I recognize time is uh, of the issue here. Um, they agree uh, to launch basically both attacks, if you like, a smaller set piece uh, in Artois and a grand sort of uh, percé uh, breakthrough battle in Champagne. Uh, 25th of September, which we'll hear about again a little bit later uh, today, uh, one of the largest or one of the larger uh, days of concerted allied activity, right? You have large attacks, two full armies, 4th Army and 2nd Army in Champagne attacking. You have uh, 10th Army in uh, Artois and, of course, the British attacking at Luz. All at the same time, you have uh, attacks uh, on the Eastern Front as well, if I'm right. Um, these attacks follow a very similar pattern. So Peytown's forces, Second Army, uh, managed to get about four kilometers um, in their initial push, and then things bogged down. Uh, in Artois, they do um, rather less well because they're still sort of worn out from the earlier Artois battles and the sort of incessant uh, uh, fighting that goes on, uh, grenotage nibbling, as Joff puts it, these little tiny little uh, fights for key bits of terrain and, and jumping off positions. Um, the point of this, um, and there's a few different points that I'll use to try to wrap up. Um, according to the French official history, it's after this battle, after the uh, Second Battle of Champagne and the Third Battle of Artois, uh, that, quote, a very clear evolution came to manifest itself in the minds of command. For the first time, all of these participants were in accordance on the following capital point. The rupture of an enemy front probably could not be realized in a single bound, but only by a series of successive and prolonged efforts. So what's the lesson? The lesson is not only that there's no breakthrough, but that the idea that you're going to get any sort of strategic value over one or two days of combat is illusory. What you need is sustained, rhythmic hammering, what we would later call the offensive uh, Offensive art, right? So, um, operational art, sorry. Um, linking together a series of smaller tactical victories to achieve a strategic aim. It's one of the great um, intellectual foresights of French commanders, especially uh, Foch, even though, of course, it's the Soviets who later on in the 1920s really codify it and um, give us the concept of operational art that we sort of have today. Uh, it paves the way for uh, the victories of 1916 for the Somme, which of course is largely fought under Foch. You get this more rhythmic, uh, slower, more careful uh, system. And Verdun, which is largely fought with Peytown at his command. Again, a bit more rhythmic, it's a defensive battle, but still very carefully uh, coordinated. Um, is 1915 worth it? Or, or are those successes worth the amount of losses they took? Probably not. Um, but it is part of a process. So I'll leave you, of course, with the way you have to end every uh, lecture on the French Army with their victory cheese. So thank you very much. It's a long way to It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. The sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, let us swear. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Oh, man.